It's one o'clock. If you're ready, Todd. Yep, I'm ready. Right. Let's go. And good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar. Uh, it's a new webinar we're doing. It's called The Power of Exchange uh, 1031s. And uh, my name is Rich Nguyen. I am one of the managing attorneys at MBH Settlement Group. And my role today is to be a host for this presentation, this webinar. Uh, and before we get started, I just want to mention that uh, coming up later this month, uh, MBH is going to have another webinar uh, about the NVAR uh, July form changes. And that's coming up on June 23rd uh, in a couple of weeks. Let's see what that's about. And that's going to be 11 a.m. on June 23rd. And if you want more information or to register, uh, please go to our website, mbh.com, under the resources tab and under agents. You'll see our class offerings. Uh, go there for more information and to register. Uh, we hope to see you there on June 23rd uh, for, at 11 a.m. And so uh, as we get started, again, my name is Rich Nguyen, and today uh, we're going to talk about uh, a topic that's uh, uh, maybe new to some of you agents that are more in a, in a residential uh, uh, capacity. Uh, this is something to more towards agents who might be moving towards having investor clients or have a lot of investor clients. Um, and we're going to delve into the world of real estate investments and a tax benefit uh, known as 1031 exchanges. Um, and today we have a special guest joining us from uh, our partner or our company uh, called Principal 1031, uh, real estate uh, um, 1031 exchange intermediary. It's a mouthful. Uh, but Todd today is going to give us more information about that. Todd Mitchell, uh, you may recognize from MBH uh, courses in the past and the work he's done here for many years. Uh, so Todd, I'll, I'll put it over to you. If you want to say hi to everyone, introduce yourself, and we'll get started. Yeah, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here with you, Rich. As Rich mentioned, uh, Principal 1031 is an MBH settlement group company. Um, we have uh, uh, originated it and put it in place to position for your success um, and make uh, the real estate transaction a little easier for our clients, our customers, and our real estate our real estate agents. Good to be here. All right. Thanks, Todd. And so, Todd, let's start with it. So for an agent or a viewer that's watching this who doesn't know what a 1031 exchange is, what's a nice, simple way of explaining it so we can dive into more details? Yeah, the, the most simple way is um, this is an investment property product. It's for um, a party who has investment properties or investment real estate and wants to sell one property and uh, purchase another. They want to stay in the investment property um, realm of interest. The 1031 exchange also goes by the name of a, a, a like kind exchange from time to time. Um, it is a tax deferred strategy. You're taking the, the proceeds from one sale. Um, and keeping them out of a, a taxable scenario and moving them into the transaction of another one. It allows that investor to reinvest their uh, proceeds from the sale um, and without being recognized by the IRS or as a taxable liability to that. And um, as we always say, since what we're going to talk about verges on tax laws and tax information, nothing we're giving you here today should be construed as tax advice. I have to say that and always uh, consult your trusted tax professional or to uh, inform your clients and notify them to inform the, uh, to, to consult their tax professional before making any decisions uh, such as a 1031 exchange. Great. Certainly. So, uh, strongly encourage consulting your tax advisor. And so um, the next question I have for you, Todd, um, you mentioned like kind exchange and it's real estate. Like what kind of property are we talking about that would qualify for a 1031 exchange? Is anything and just anything under the sun or are there specific criteria? No, for the most part, it's got to be investment property. There's a fairly, lib fairly liberal rules for the exclusions and for the gain of the sale of the principal residence. But the capital gain on the sale of an investment property is what's recognized. Um, in a 1031 exchange, it involves the sale of investment property or the like kind, while the sale of the investment property typically triggers a taxable event um, with the exchange when done property, it'll allow the taxpayer to defer those capital gains on the property that they're trying to sell. No gain or loss shall be recognized if the tax deferred exchange is being done correctly. Okay. And, um, and, and and you, you mentioned uh, deferring capital gains. Can you go into a little more detail about what's the benefit of doing that for someone that doesn't 
already. Yeah, a couple factors there. First of all, the Internal Revenue Service um, formalized their regulations back in um, uh, effective in 2020 on the identity of what real property is. And there's uh, you can qualify into three different scenarios of uh, the identity of real property. The first one is uh, the property must be classified under the state or local law, um, the, the date of the transaction that the property is classified as real property under the laws of that jurisdiction. The second one speci specifically lists the property as real property as a final regulation. And, and, um, and then the third one is considered real property based on all the facts and circumstances under the various factors provided in those final regulations issued by the IRS. The relinquishment, that's the second stage here, the relinquishment of the property of the taxpayer, um, the taxpayer, that property must be a productive investment property um, used in a trade or a business, means of income producing. Um, you could have your, uh, a townhouse that you rent out, you could have a storefront that you lease, um, that property must be held in, in an investment scenario. Examples of that um, and of eligible properties are, you can have raw land that was farmed, you can have uh, apartment buildings that are wholly leased, hotels that are uh, transient, uh, shopping centers, malls, office buildings, um, uh, rental properties I touched base on, and then industrial properties that are out there for rent. The property cannot be used for personal use, um, such as like a principal residence or a second home slash vacation home. Those type of properties do not qualify to a 1031 tax deferred exchange. And so if I'm hearing right, if you have a, uh, for the most part, purely investment property and you sell it, um, and if you weren't going to use a 1031 exchange, you would have a taxable event. Is that right, Todd? This is correct. And if you didn't do 1031 exchange, you you may be subject or would likely be subject to capital gains taxes, right? Correct. And so by doing a 1031 exchange, you the keyword is defer those gains, right? And can you talk about what's the next step in getting that deferring? What does that mean, deferring in the, in the whole scheme of things? The deferment of, of the transaction and the, the benefits of deferring the... the mm, First, um, there's the, the principal timeline of the money. That is, that to, in today's dollars, um, it's just um, the stronger buying power than it will in the, in the, in the future. Um, so the, the, the money today is working stronger for you for the price of goods and eroding the value of the dollar. Um, secondly, less obviously, but um, maybe more significant is that the leverage advantage is putting off the taxes on a purchase with a purchasing power. And an example of that is with the purchasing power, um, investors uh, say they sell a property with a profit, profit of $100,000. We use round numbers here. Um, after paying state and federal taxes of those, we're gonna use 37% as a basis there. The investors left with about $63,000 to reinvest. Assuming a 20% down payment on the next property with the $63,000, they'll be able to purchase a property around $315,000. If that gain were deferred and not recognized as a taxable event with an exchange or a like kind, the investor would have the cash to purchase somewhere around a $500,000 property. Assuming a 5% rate of appreciation over the first year, the investor would gain have a gain of $15,750 in that scenario, but would see a gain of about $25,000 if the tax was not, if it was untaxed dollars. So you right. can see the benefit of not taking that money and paying the, uh, out of the property and not paying those taxes at that time. When you right. sell the next property, then you may have the potential gains. Great. So really, it really increases your buying power, defers the taxes. You can use the money now it and does. down the road. Um, I, I understand conceivably you could kick that deferred tax can down the road quite far. We won't get into that today, but uh, deferred can be quite some time. Uh, Correct. I'm not going to say never because never say never, but quite some time. Great. 
So thanks for that, Todd. Uh, that's a great example there of the power of a 1031 exchange. Um, and back to sort of the nuts and bolts of it. Um, so when we deal with uh, form contracts, et cetera, um, what can you say about the contract needing language referencing a 1031 exchange? Anything special needed there, Todd? It, that's a great question. And it certainly does. Um, if you're in the Northern Virginia area, the, our, the Northern Virginia contract in the contingency clauses has some language um, that the non-1031 party will be cooperative in completion of the 1031 exchange, such as no additional expense of the non to the non-1031 party because of the exchange, and that title may be conveyed directly between the parties listed in the contract. Um, if you're not in the Northern Virginia area and you're not using any of the NBAR doc documents, Principal 1031, we can provide you um, assistance with those addendums and um, subsequent addendums to put as part of the contract. Um, the 1031 intermediary principal in this scenario um, is merely assigning the rights in this purchase assignment uh, or the sales contract with the other party. We, we're going to have to be integrated into that transaction as a qualified intermediary. Uh, the contract may be as assigned to the qualified in intermediary, for intermediary for the purpose of completing the interest and in the exchange. Um, those examples are that uh, principal 1031 would send an addendum after the contract, identifying ourselves into the transaction. And this reiterates to all parties that are to that contract that the proceeds from that sale are going to be coming to us and not going directly to this the sale investor. Great. Yeah. So, so if I hear you right, um, if a client who's selling a property has uh, wants to start a 1031, they should reach out to principal 1031 and we'll take it from there, right? We'll walk them through the steps, give them the addendums they need, help them navigate that. Uh, to make sure they're in compliance. Is that right, Todd? We certainly will. They will not be able to do this on their own. The taxpayer cannot navigate nor have those proceeds come into any personal account or accounts of related parties or any related entity that they are party to. So they want to seek professional advice from a tax attorney or CPA. Um, but um, generally speaking, a consumer will not be able to do this on their own. And, and, yeah, and to clarify, so this this the special term for principal 1031 is a qualified intermediary, right? So that's the qualified part is, is, is important to note. You can't just wake up right. one day, decide to start a company, hold funds for folks, and then expect the IRS to not tax them. It's not quite that simple. Uh, yeah. We like to uh, make the process simple for your clients, but leave it to principal 1031, and they'll make it seem as simple as possible for an otherwise complicated uh, tax code. Uh, regulation right and yeah. um and going on from there um so we've talked about selling the property the investment property we've talked about the uh qualified intermediary principal 1031 holding the proceeds from the sale right so the next step um how would an investor go and reinvest that money um from there um they would have to identify um a the reinvestment property um, they would have to, there's specific timelines. We'll get into those in a couple minutes. Um, but they're going to, uh, have to identify a qualified intermediary to be the accommodator. Um, they're going to have to enter into a written exchange agreement with that qualified intermediary. Um, that's going to go through the specific regulations that that taxpayer is going to have no rights to those funds um, in the interim. We will hold those funds for a certain amount of time, giving the taxpayer, the relinquishing property owner, uh, the time frame to identify the replacement property. Um, and hopefully that agreement will not terminate in that time frame. There are specific time frames that um, I'll touch base on in a little bit. Um, the, the you cannot be a qualified intermediary, as I mentioned earlier on yourself, you cannot manage this yourself and you cannot have entities that are related to you um, to do that as well. 
um, certain relatives don't qualify, entities which are owned by the taxpayer don't qualify, uh, LLC that may be shared by the taxpayer do not qualify as either. Um, the tax code is very specific to this. Um, the qualified intermediary, intermediary must prepare all the necessary documents within the structure of a 1031 exchange. They must hold those funds from the sale um, of the relinquished property in escrow, and they may only release those funds um, for the purchase of the replacement property or at the extinguishment of the time frame that the uh, taxpayer has to replace the property. And so it sounds like, um, so it sounds like to me is that if you sell a property, it's an investment, you can't touch the money, right? And then it's held by principal 1031. And then when you're ready to buy a new property, that money comes out of that escrow account, right? And it goes towards the purchase of the, the replacement property. I think that's, that's the terminology used, right? In order to fully defer the tax liability, the taxpayer cannot touch that money. It cannot go into their account. Um, and the value of the repla the or the value of those interests must move solely from the sale of the property into the intermediary and then back to the purchase of the relinquished property or the replacement property. Great. And um, and with the replacement property, the one being bought um, with these these funds, um, can you talk about when uh, the time frame when when a taxpayer or, or an investor could enter into a contract to buy that replacement property? And the replacement property can even be identified can be identified at any time. It could even be identified prior to the closing of the relinquished property, um, or even the sale of the relinquished property. The, the sale of the relinquished property. Um, the value. Uh, there's a couple of other criteria that go into that. Um, identifying those replacement properties, the value of the replacement property must be equal to or greater than the adjusted sales price of the relinquished property. And you can buy up to multiple properties as long as you're not going over a 200% of the relinquished property's value. You can buy um, three properties to replace one property. An example of that is you could sell one property and with a $100,000 gain, that property's value was $500,000, you gained with mortgage payoffs and closing costs, round numbers, $300,000. You could take $100,000 and buy three separate properties. As long as the value of those three separate properties did not go over a million dollars, which would be the 200% mark of the value of the relinqu relinquished property. So those are a couple little guidelines there. The total cash proceeds from the relinquished property must be held by the qualified intermediary in, in escrow and reinvested into the re replacement property. Great. And, um, and as I said at the beginning, we're just scratching the surface here, right? So things, for example, the nuances where you can buy more than one property. There's a lot of nuances, right, Todd? Uh, what's Correct. something you could tell, sort of reiterate to, to anyone considering a 1031 based on those nuances? And What's going, what you're talking about? You most definitely want to be attentive to your time frames. You're from the sale, the settlement of the relinquished property. You have 45 days to identify the new property. You may have had it identified already. That's just perfectly fine. You may know at the exact same time that you're selling your property what property you want to purchase. Totally fine. But from the sale of the property, you have that that date. You have 45 days to relinquish the property. If no property is identified, and all you have to do is identify what the replacement property is, if no property is identified, those dollars will be returned to you from the intermediary because that time frame is the maximum amount of time the money can be held. There is one more date. It's 180 days. And that is for the replacement property to close. There's a nice time frame in there. You can name the replacement property in the 45 days close on the replacement property within 180 days. So if you're looking at new construction, a, a little nuance here, if you're looking at new construction and you name a replacement property within the 45 days, that's a new construction home, you wanna make sure you're working with that builder. They can deliver the replacement property with a RUP within the 180 day timeframe. 
or you're going to be fall outside of your time frame compliances. And uh, I, know, I know the answer to this, but does principal 1031 help our, our investor clients meet these deadlines? And, and we certainly do. Um, from day one, when the contract comes over, um, we have a, a tickler system that um, uh, establishes and the letters in, of engagement that we put out to you are going to have those dates um, and those timeframes identified immediately. And we'll put reminders out as well as the time goes on to be sure that everybody's on top of um, making sure that they're compliant with the timeframes. Great. So it sounds like principal 1031 does a lot. Um, they help save investors tax, uh, defer their tax liability to enhance the power, their buying power of their investment dollars. Uh, what, what do these services cost, Todd, for your average or for per transaction? Um, the cost with principal 1031 is $950. And that service is uh, managing the relinquished property and the um, process of providing the funds for the replacement property. So it is the two properties combined. It is not per property, it's per transaction. That's good to know. And, um, and as we, I think you covered most of the topics, the, the, the high points of a somewhat complicated section of the, the IRS tax code. I appreciate you doing that, condensing it for our, our, our viewers today. Um, and if, if someone watching there wants to uh, have principal 1031 help them with a 1031 exchange or as a, a, a client that needs help, what should they do, Todd? Um, they can uh, get all, all of our information. They can reach out to us. Um, uh, our email address is principal1031.com. I mean, our website is principal1031.com. Our The best email address to use is info at principal1031.com. So if you'd like to email us for information at info at principal1031.com is the best uh, to get a hold of you. Our phone number, if you have any questions or concerns, you can contact uh, myself or um, uh, Vanessa works with us in our 1031 uh, platform, um, but the phone number is 703-334-2400. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and with the principal, right, I always have a, a thing where I go, is it L-E or A-L? A rule of thumb I came up with, the uh, principal with an E for exchange is an easy way to remember. Ah, oh, nice. Yeah. I like that. For exchange. Just came up with that. But so if you need to get more info, please jump on the website, principal with an E, 1031.com. Uh, and again, info at principal 1031 dot com is email right todd you got it okay well unless you have everything else todd i think we're all set i appreciate everyone joining us today for the power of exchange 1031s i hope you found this uh informative and enjoyable and uh, as we have more um uh, offerings and webinars about this product and other uh form changes etc please check out our website mbh.com under resources and agents for those classes and uh we'll see you all next time thank you very much for uh, joining us Thanks, Rich. Thanks, Todd.